All right, guys. So first thing I want to do is I want to review the dorsal digital expansion, okay, or what's commonly known as the dorsal expansion hood, extensor mechanism. Those terms are all synonymous. What I really want you to understand and the big points to a picture like this is first thing, orient yourself. Big, big key points of information here. Where are my joints? There's my MCP, okay? What do I see at my MCP? I see something called the sagittal bands. Those sagittal bands are going to be right at the MCP joint. What do I see at the PIP joint? the proximal interphalangeal joint. Well, what I see is I see that this central slip, which is a really key point, is crossing that joint on its way to attach into the middle phalanx, okay? Another key point of information, where that Extensor digitorum communis, that EDC tendon attaches in both on the lateral slips and on the central slip, really, really important because as we start getting into finger deformities, that's gonna become a key piece of information. Now, next thing we need to look at is what's happening here at my DIP joint, my distal, distal excuse me, interphalangeal joint. Well, I have a much different situation here. First thing I see is I have a very similar band like I, had, I saw down here at the MCP joint, but this time it's going to be called the triangular ligament. It's going to hold in and it's going to provide a little bit of continuity to these lateral bands that are coming in, okay? Lateral bands, being letter K here, very important because these lateral bands are going to continue on. EDC is going to feed into them as we're gonna see right here, colored in blue. And those lateral bands are gonna to come together to attach in on the dorsal aspect of the distal phalanx. That's how I'm going to be able to extend my digits all the way down to those distal phalanges. So very important to know. Know that extensor digitorum communis, the central slip attaches in or inserts at the middle phalanx, the lateral bands, the lateral slip will continue all the way down to the distal phalanx. On top of that, what we're gonna see is we're gonna see lumbricals and interosseous muscles, right? So if we look at J, J is going to be one of those interosseous bands, okay? F down here is going to be, we're going to color this in blue, one of those lumbrical muscles. Now remember those lumbricals are really super special because they're going to originate from the flexor digitorum profundus muscle. They also are going to have two completely different actions at different joints. Remember that my lumbrical is going to be responsible for MCP flexion, but it will be responsible for IP extension, okay? So lumbrical does a couple different things. On top of that, we're also going to have, we're going to color this one in green, this dorsal interossei muscle. Dorsal interossei muscle is extremely important because Remember those pads and dabs, okay? So this is going to be a dorsal. It's going to abduct 
my digits. So we're going to color this one all the way in green. And what we have to understand is we have to understand that there's going to be a joint action that happens here. We're going to see that all these muscles working together is what's going to give me finger extension. I'm going to need that. If I don't have that, or as we start getting into pathology, how is my finger going to be deformed if one of these bands has been disrupted? If one of these muscles is not functioning properly? That's what we're going to see as physical therapists. That's why we need to know this. So first thing I want you to do is really be familiar with this picture. Be very, very aware of what's happening here. Okay, my suggestion is that you're able to reproduce this picture and you know exactly where each of these muscles are going. That would be my suggestion. So next thing we're going to look at here, and this is why these central slips and these lateral slips and central bands and lateral bands are so important, is because I need to understand what is happening at each and every joint. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to label the joints. Right here, that's my MCP. This muscle right here should already be very familiar. That's going to be one of my lumbricals. So as we see, that lumbrical is going to traverse from the flexor side, the palmar side of the MCP joint, join in with his extensor expansion hood, and end up on the dorsal side of the finger. Second joint I need to be aware of is going to be that joint right in there. That's going to be my PIP joint. This joint, obviously, then is going to be my DIP joint. So what I'm seeing here on the left-hand side of the picture is that when I have PIP flexion, okay, my central tendon is stretched. Okay, and we can see that. <clears throat> Remember that if I want to stretch something, I'm going to do the opposite action. Okay, so if I want to stretch an extender, I'm going to do flexion. If I'm going to stretch an abductor, I'm going to do adduction. Same concept. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I see here is when I have PIP flexion, that central tendon is going to be stretched over top on the dorsal aspect of the PIP joint. Now, here's what you have to ask yourself. What happens if, and I'll put that in red, so a little more apparent. What happens if that central tendon snaps? What are you gonna ask yourself? What's gonna happen? I'm going to have a lack of PIP extension because the central tendon from the extender digitorum or extensor digitorum communis attaches in and crosses that PIP joint. You may still have a little because the lateral bands are still intact, but I'm going to have a deformity. My PIP joint is going to be offset in a resting position in a little bit of flexion. Now take a look at the picture on the right. We see a much different picture here. Now what I have, okay, here's my MCP. Here's my PIP. And there's my DIP. Now what I have is I have my central tendon on slack, okay? So PIP 
extension equals central tendon on slack. DIP flexion equals lateral bands on stretch. So that's what we need to recognize here. We need to recognize that if I see with my patient, I ask them to hold their hand out and I notice that the distal phalanx from here to here is stuck in flexion and they're not able to extend it, then I better start looking at something like a disruption in the lateral bands, not necessarily the central tendon. Very different picture to what we see on the left-hand side of the screen. I want to make sure you understand that. My suggestion is practice on yourselves, practice on a roommate, partner, family member, do pure MCP flexion and extension. Then brace the proximal phalanx, do PIP, flexion extension. Think about not only what muscles are causing that action to happen, but what tendons are on stretch, what tendons are on slack, okay? Then do the same thing for the DIP joint. That really and truly is a very good way to learn this material because it gets very confusing, as you can see, very fast. I wanted to also spend a little bit of time with this picture. This picture is essentially a normal, okay? So this is normal. And then below there are two very common finger deformities. This one is what we call a swan neck deformity. What we see, again, we're going to label this out. Here's my MCP. Here's my PIP. There's my DIP. First thing I want you to do, label out your joints. That'll help you out a lot. Now we're going to start labeling out all these different fun lines. Okay, and a lot of these lines should make a lot of sense. The red one is going to be that central tendon, one we just talked about. Blue one are going to be the lateral bands. Green. It's going to be lumbrical, nice and easy. And I'm not sure what just happened, but something fun. And then the purple is going to be, I'm going to Draw this in red, but you guys are going to know it's purple. <clears throat> That's going to be our good old flexor digitorum profundus. Okay? So first thing you got to do when you look at these different finger deformities is really think about what's happening here. And the system I want you to use is MCP, PIP, DIP. It's the first thing you got to do, okay? So what I see with a swan neck deformity is I have a little bit of flexion, tiny bit, at my MCP joint. I have extension.
at my PIP joint, and I have flexion at my DIP joint. What I will tell you clinically is that this MCP flexion usually is so insignificant, it looks relatively neutral and normal, okay? So don't even worry about that one. What I will see with a swan neck deformity is that PIP extension and the DIP extension. Why is that? Very simple. I'm dealing with a posterior displacement of the lateral band, okay? Where's that lateral band attach? That lateral band should attach at my distal phalanx. What typically is happening here is that bands like the triangular ligament are disrupting. They're not holding in those lateral bands like they should. So since the lateral bands are not where they should be because I have this pulley system in my finger, they do what they do. The extensor digitorum communis is going to contract because it doesn't have any counterforce against it. And that's going to pull my PIP joint into extension. And it's going to pull my DIP joint into flexion. Now, what I have here at the bottom is something called a boutonniere's deformity. The best way I can describe a boutonniere's deformity is as the picture shows, but Basically, if you were going to take something like a needle and hold it between your index finger, your first finger, second digit, and your thumb, and push the pads together, that's essentially what a boutonniere's deformity is. Again, what I have here, let's go through the system. What's happening here at my MCP joint? Well, heck, I got extension here. Here's my PAP joint. I got flexion happening here. And now my DIP joint, I got extension again. Why is that happening? I have a rupture of that central tendon, that central slip that attaches in to that middle phalanx. What's going to happen there is that since that central tendon is slipping and rupturing. It puts the PIP joint in flexion and the lateral bands are now below. And we can see that here. I shouldn't say below. I should say on the volar side now or the palmar side of the axis of rotation. Again, they're gonna do what they do. They're gonna contract. They're gonna pull that finger back. So what I have is I have anterior or volar or palmar displacement of the lateral band. That will cause extension at my MCP joint, flexion at my PAP joint, and extension at my DIP joint. Next point I wanna talk about is this concept of the anatomic snuff box, okay? Anatomic snuff box is extremely important. It is extremely important as physical therapists. It is extremely important as physical therapists that are going to see patients via direct access. Here's why. One of the main fractures, one of the largest fractures, most prevalent fractures that gets undiagnosed or missed on x-ray is going to be a scaphoid fracture. We will be able to palpate the scaphoid through the anatomic snuff box. Anatomic snuff box is like any other space that we've gone over. 
all the anatomic snuff box is, is basically just a space where the tendons come apart a little bit, okay? I'm going to draw these in. And these guys all make all the way, all the way down to the thumb. Okay, so the three tendons I'm gonna see here are going to be extensor, pollicis, longus. I'm gonna see abductor, pollicis longus. I'm also going to see extensor pollicis brevis. Those are going to be the three muscles that make up the space. Now, what's really interesting to note here is I'm going to have a couple structures that are lying deep. One of those structures is going to be the scaphoid. Just superficial, the scaphoid is going to be this radial artery, and this is why it's so important. So there's my radial artery. Reason that we want to make sure we palpate the anatomic snuff box with our wrist patients is because, especially with the wrist patients that have fallen on an outstretched arm, is that there is a lot of times, like I said, that you can have a scaphoid fracture that does not show up on x-ray. Also, you can have scaphoid fractures and injuries of the scaphoid bone that really get bad because the blood supply is lost. And then you get a condition called avascular necrosis avascular meaning lack of blood, necrosis meaning death. And that's exactly what happens is that the scaphoid fracture disrupts the blood flow to the bone and the bone ends up dying because it has a lack of blood supply. So make sure you know the borders, just like every other space we've gone over so far. Location, borders, content. Where's the location? It's on the radial side of the wrist. Borders, extensor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis longus. Contents, scaphoid, radial artery. It's pretty simple space. 